Hello everyone, today we're sitting down with Louis Pilfort, a person on the forefront of bringing uh, types to the Erlang land. Uh, his magnum opus is called Gleam Programming Language. It's implemented in Rust and at the moment compiles to both Erlang and JavaScript. He is also uh, one of the most articulate uh, speakers in the functional programming community and perhaps programming community as a whole. Um, his talk on Gleam Programming Language uh, is the best language intro I've ever heard, hands down. Uh, so, uh, Louis, please tell us what is your secret when it comes to giving concise presentations? <laughs> Uh, um, practice, 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 lots of practice, um, probably stems from, from doing lots of theatre back in the day, but, um, I know, I know lots of people are capable of just of finishing up their slides on, on the, on the, the plane or the train or whatever on the way over, but I, I don't work that way at all. I, I have to, I've got to have a really clear idea of, of what it is I'm trying to convey to people. And then I spend a lot of time sort of like plotting that out, like what points go together in, in sort of like a, a path that makes sense as a narrative and then working on the slides and then rehearsing it. And then, oh, well, that bit didn't fit quite so well with that one. And then just doing lots of refactoring. I like refactoring in everything. So like refining, refining, refining until I finally get somewhere, um, which which, you know, that, that you, you, you've been very kind to me in the intro. Um, so, so, yes, I think it, it does pay off, but it just means it takes an incredible amount of hours, um, which is probably why I don't do quite as many presentations as I'd like to. But um, but yeah, it does work. Just tr treat it like a show. Right. So so you you test your uh, presentations uh, on people before you give it to, to to the crowd, so to speak. Right. If, if I'm once I'm feeling very brave, but to start, it's normally just 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 see if you can say it, you know, try try and say the whole thing from start to finish. And you'll notice like, oh, that felt really awkward. Like oh, I, d I didn't feel like I was putting the message across. And then you, you could move on to recording it and watching yourself, which is always just like the most painful, cringy experience ever. It's like, oh, gosh, oh, I looked awful when I was doing that. And then eventually you get to a point when you're happy enough to give it to people. And then they rip it to shreds. So it's it's quite a it's quite a arduous process, really. But um, I, it it does pay dividends. It, it's like everything, you know. The, the best way to get good at something is to be bad at it repeatedly for quite a long time. And eventually, once you've been bad at it enough, you 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 work out which bits are good, and you can refine those things. Right. So um, yeah, it's actually really interesting to 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 learn that uh, you have been acting. Uh, for for how long were you acting, and uh, did it, did it go anywhere? Oh. Um, uh, how long? I I probably start. So I think I think at one point my my mother decided I was too too much of a, a, a socially awkward nerd who spent all his time on the computer. So I was like, you're gonna go to you're gonna go to theatre classes or something like that. I was probably I don't know maybe eleven or so, and it just turned out to be a really wonderful experience actually. Um, and I, I did a lot of that all the way through up to, to through my teenage years. Um, and then I probably stopped around the time I went to university um, because I wasn't able to find the, like a, a, the correct, the correct feeling theater troupe for me. So I wasn't, I wasn't able to continue, but um, yeah, it was, it was, it was fantastically useful. I'd probably recommend any, anyone, if they have a slightly nerdy kid, shove them, shove them through the door of a theater and get them to learn some, some other skills. Right. Uh, yeah. For, for, for many of us, uh, the closest we get to theater is, is uh, improvisation at the Dungeons and Dragons table, right? Which, which actually, in my experience, helps quite a bit uh, in, in business when it comes to like coming up with something on the spot during some negotiation or something like that. Um, yeah, not, 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 to say, not to say I'm treating my business partners as uh, NPCs, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> You're treating them as dragons to be slain. <laughs> yeah. Basically. But I think I think you're right though. Like um, weirdly, and I, I don't think I ever would have expected this when I was younger. But the the skill that I learned from school or from from you know any, any kind of education that's been most applicable to working in business has been theatre. You know, um, I haven't I haven't used so much of all that that you know maths and science and English and stuff. But th just the ability to get up in front of a collection of people and try and convey something to them, or trying to put yourself in in, in you know, some kind of role in, so, in some particular pair of shoes. That's really useful, particularly when you're, you know, new to a, a, a role or a team or a company or anything, 
and you might have imposter syndromes like well I, I obviously can't do this but I can pretend to be someone who can do this and it turns out like pretending to do something in these situations is kind of the same thing as actually doing it so um, yeah the, the, the subtle art of faking it until you're making it is super useful yeah yeah especially when approached ethically right uh, as opposed oh, yeah. to some some Silicon Valley startups <laughs> um, all right um, so yeah, let's let's drop the theater a bit. Uh, I wonder if you are following uh, modern theater, and if you, if you do, what are your some some of your favorite troops? I I I um, very unfortunately I I've the whole programming thing has rather taken up a lot of my time lately. So I don't I don't invest nearly as much time into theater and music and art as I'd really like to. But um, more recently, I've I've. Um, I live I live in London, so there's there's loads of really great stuff here, and you know the the really obvious ones are um, you know the National Theatre, you know the, the supposedly the, one, the greatest theatre in the country, which always has like plays on on such an incredible scale that's both um, artistically and, and technically so excellent, like really really the cream of the crop with very sophisticated, complicated um, sets and pieces of movements. It's really fun. And then we've also got the Globe, you know, the Shakespeare's own Globe, which is, um, you know, I was, I, yeah, I guess I always thought when when I was a bit younger that Shakespeare was quite stuffy, but if you go there, it's it's it's. Um, I, I feel like Shakespeare fans are quite stuffy, but Shakespeare is not. Like Shakespeare, Shakespeare's a bunch of of um, you know knob knob gags and, and and dick jokes and all that kind of stuff, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> um, so yeah, well well worth checking it in like the authentic experience. And then lastly, I've been going to the odd um, sort of like small independent burlesque nights and stuff, which is sort of a different kind of theatre. Um, but yeah, that's really fun as well. There's one show called Lads, which um, I, I was really enjoying before the pandemic. And hopefully I'll be enjoying it after the pandemic as well. Nice. Um, yeah, that's that's quite a list. Um, yeah, <laughs> actually, it's, it's interesting because um, actually the co-founder of Sirocco, um He's, uh, he's coming from a theater from ballet family and ah. uh, he he even uh, acted a little bit in uh, in the, uh, the I think in Mariinsky theater which is one of the legendary theaters of the world as wow. well so we talked about how kind of like humanities side of thing helps us to to do business and to convey ideas better right but do you think that actually there is something about humanities that is um, that is important for developers themselves during their day-to-day -day job. Hmm. I, yeah, I think so. Um, so you know, we, we've sort of already touched on how you know theatre can give you a different set of skills that's like super applicable and working in a team, um, particularly trying to communicate in different ways. So I, I, you know, and I think that does extend to you know other humanity subjects. Um, Writing software is just a small part of the actual. Uh, well, writing code is just a small part of the act of like building software as part of a team. You know, you could be a you could be a ten x programmer, but you won't be able to compete an entire team of people working at their best. So, if you can do something that you know improves the the, the team as a whole, that's going to be super impactful. That's that's possibly going to be that's almost certainly going to be um, more important than just working on on your own individual output. But then I think I think there's also, and I, I think this gets talked about more and more, particularly on, on like Twitter and social media and stuff. But the, you know, there's also the the um, the impact that the things we have ha have on the world. You know, I think it's very easy as um, software developers say, "Oh, well, I just I just make the app or something." But the things we make, you know, alters people's lives. Um, and a, a really extreme example would be working in, um, you know, like gambling or. or, or um, you know, another another industry that could be seen as quite predatory, you know, that impacts people's lives. And, and in, in working on those things, I think we are complicit. So I think it's good to take an outlook that is encouraged by a lot of these, um, you know, humanity subjects to look at the bigger picture. You know, what what is the thing you're actually doing? Yes, we're shipping code, but like, what does that do? Um, and, you know, there's, there's a lot of wonderful technology like facial recognition, fantastically interesting technology really powerful look all these amazing things we can do with machine learning um but if you apply it quite ha ha quite haphazardly um such in some of the rollouts we've seen in in um law enforcement you know and you, you ship what is effectively a buggy model um because you haven't thought about um the fact your training data doesn't represent the whole of society it only works on white people for example or something like that 
you've accidentally done something that causes harm. So it's really important to have this this higher level um, outlook on the world because fundamentally, people are the thing that matters. Really, you know that that's the thing we're changing. Um, you know, the people we interact with daily, but the the people that we interact with via the things we make. So yeah, I think I think it's I think it's really worthwhile and it's more fun. You know, be be, be a multifaceted person. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and and um, yeah, this is one of the things that we are. Uh, for example, in our company, thinking uh, very proactively, and, and a lot of people I know are are thinking about the, the their impact. Yeah, as mm. as uh, technical people, maybe as engineers, and uh, it's uh, always a, a very very considerable dilemma for for people who are aware, yeah, of implications of what they're doing, uh, whether or not to like accept certain contract or not even if it might be otherwise lucrative. All right, so um, let's kind of circle back into other stuff that helps uh, teams be more productive, like programming languages and compilers themselves, right? Uh, um, So um, can you say a couple of words about like the importance of of automated tools uh, to help teams build software? be it like a mm. compiler or like a test runner, et cetera. Like what, 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 how does computer actually help us build more stuff on computers? Sure thing. And, you know, and, and this and, you know, what we were just talking about is, is, um, you know, very much a lot of the drive of, of Gleam, the language that I'm making. Um, you know, I, I, <clears throat> it's important to think a lot about how, um, the tools that we work with impact us on on a daily basis and how the how the things we make impact people and i'm um you know i'm i'm largely of the opinion that programming especially uh, particularly uh, in a professional context particularly if you have to operate the software running production is actually really stressful like it's re- it's really challenging it's a lot of work and you know sometimes you get to the end of the day you're like gosh i'm exhausted you know i've actually had a really bad time because i've been trying to find that bug or production's gone down or, oh, I really wanted to get that feature done today, but I just couldn't quite get all the pieces to line up. That really sucks. You know, we've, we've built an ecosystem that, that um, people get to the end of the day and they, they feel drained. That's awful. And so I really want to, you know, take away as much of that, that pain as possible. And so my, and there's, you know, lots of people have different ideas about how you do this, but the way my, my, my thesis, my, 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 um, the idea that I'm subscribing to is that we really want the computer to do as much as the work as possible. You know, if there's something that we can get the computer to do for you, that's one less thing you have to worry about. And maybe you need to like, you know, you've got to to, um, play the the game of the the tool or the compiler or the type checker, whatever it is. But in exchange, that should give you back more return. So um, in Gleam, that means we're making very heavy use of static analysis. We want the compiler to tell you, hey, you've made a change. Well, you need to go to this file, this file, this file, and this file, and then everything will be consistent again. That's great because you know if if you've ever worked in like a very large um, code base in, I don't know Java or or, or or worse Python or Ruby or JavaScript, just the act of finding things, particularly if you're new to a team, and then maybe you've also got that um, imposter syndrome thing as well, that can be really very stressful. So, you know, the more we can, the more we can build into these automated tools the better, I think. I think that's really important. Yeah, and uh, in regards to, to the act of finding stuff is uh, also um, interesting wh- how, how like documentation, because sometimes the, the answer is, oh, just write comments or just write documentation, right? How, how documentation kind of diverges from uh, the reality, uh, which, which can actually cause more in my opinion, can cause more time of uh, during onboarding uh, than than less. And um, uh, so, what, what's your take on on kind of automating documentation, making sure that that, that the English that we write to communicate mm. with each other does not diverge from from the code that we write for the machine? So, I, I very much used to be of the philosophy like don't don't write comments because it means you haven't made things clear enough. But I've definitely mellowed a lot when it comes to that in recent years particularly within the gleam compiler and i've become quite quite a heavy commenter which i think has really paid off actually um possibly because it's just it, it's a lot more of a complicated system than than 
um, I don't know, web applications I've worked in in the past, just because it's a bit less, maybe not more complicated, but less familiar. Like it's it's patterns that you, in web applications, it's often the same patterns, so there's a lot more familiarity. While you probably need to explain things a lot more inside a inside a type checker because fewer people are familiar with type checkers. But yes, there's always the problems like how do you keep things up to date? And and I think there's a few things. I think a, a good example is um, in a statically typed language, there's a lot less um, temptation to write types in comments. I often see in in dynamically typed languages, people write, oh, this function takes these arguments and it returns these ones. Well, you don't need to do that in a statically typed language because it's actually part of the code. And because of that, it can actually be verified. So that's one thing um, that could drift very easily that um you know it can no longer drift because you, you don't write it in there and then it gets checked um so that's nice otherwise the, the bit that is prose that explains you know why how you know when etc that's a lot more challenging and i think you know and i'm maybe i'm wrong in fact it'd be really lovely if i'm wrong because it means we can make things even better but i think this might just be a human process thing i think much in the same way that you know, lots of teams today say, well, you haven't written the tests, so you can't, you know, you can't merge that into the code base. It's not good enough yet. You know, I think we just need to get in the habit of saying, you know, well, this, this comment's out of date or like, oh, could you perhaps write down why, why you've wanted to do this? And then it becomes, you know, second nature. It just becomes part of the culture of your team, which, um, you know, isn't, isn't quite as good an answer as, well, the type checker would do it for you because now you actually need to do some work. But I think it really pays dividends. All right. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm kind of passively looking into uh, ways to automate this human process, uh, perhaps to integrate it with continuous integration. And uh, yeah, I've I've seen some stuff, but I don't quite remember the names. Uh, I, we might add it to the uh, to the notes um, in the description of the video. Um, and yeah, uh, there, but uh, certainly certainly some approach um, to kind of parsing. Um, the uh, the documentation and ma and uh, making computers understand uh, well where wh where is this sentence coming from like from which mm -hmm. kind of commit hash or something right and uh, if the function uh, for which the d documentation was written changed um, is certainly in my opinion something that that is theoretically possible and that's certainly something that we should look at in moving into the future um and also so i think one, yep so, so one thing that um i think both rust and elixir do which which is really cool and i, I want to steal it for gleam at some point is that the bits of the the written documentation that are is code for examples uh, you know examples for example examples so not sentence for the examples can be extracted out and run as tests so that's super that's really cool and i think Thing. I'm not sure if this is true or not. I'll, I'll probably have to check and, and, and come back later. But I think also in Rust, they um, if you refer to the name of a, a constructor or a type or something, it becomes a link. And I, it might be that if that is wrong, then it gives you a warning or something. So if you say, please be sure to, to you know check this type or to use this type or something like that, and you've since deleted it, it will then um, tell you, I think. I'll, I'll have to check that one. But the, yeah, there's little things where we can pull out you know, concrete things that are human understandable and, and do stuff with. There's also a tool for Elixir, which I'm not sure is still in development, but um, a few years ago was about called Inch, which would um, analyze your code base and tell you areas. Um, it would try, try and give you a sort of um, holistic score for your documentation. And like, well, you've got the, the, we've identified these functions as being important because if you look at your call graph, it gets used in a lot of places. Hey, maybe this is a place you want to add some documentation. So that doesn't that doesn't tell you things that are out of date, but it may tell you places where it's valuable to to add things. So perhaps that's um, you know, perhaps there's loads of little pieces that we can add together, and then once we've unified all these little tools, we can actually get like a you know something that covers the majority of cases. Yeah. Perhaps. Yeah. This is and this is a very uh, as far as I understand your philosophy. This is a very uh, big topic for Gleam, right? How to cover like vast majority of of, of use cases, uh, and start shipping straight away. You can you can s talk a little bit about this bit of, of the Glimpse philosophy a little bit more. Um, yeah, and perhaps we... and perhaps it's a fine fine time to maybe say a couple of words about Erlang and why you're targeting uh, Beam in the mm. first place. 
Yes, yes. Um, so it's a trick because I'm so used to talking to Erlangers. So, I, you know, there's, there's, this, there's this base level where you say, we were Erlang people. I won't bother talking about Erlang. Let's just continue and talk about types and stuff. But no, we, it's really important to talk about Erlang because it's just, it's such an unusual ecosystem. They've got a lot of different attitudes towards things than, than lots of other ones do. And so um, you can't just say, oh, it's Erlang, it's good. So, so I, I would say Erlang, to some extent, has um, the same sort of philosophy in that, you know, lots of things are, are difficult and challenging when operating software. And we want to, um, you know, reduce that risk, reduce that stress as much as possible. I think, I think the, the motivation for making things more reliable in Erlang was probably not they want to make the programmers less stressed, but more they want their business to be more reliable. But it has the same impact, right? Fewer, fewer engineers being paged at the three in the morning to fix something. So in, in Erlang, there is this idea that a system should run forever and never die, you know, you know, and, and um, this comes from the fact that uh, Erlang was originally made for tele uh, firmware for tele telephony devices, you know, so a box that sits at the top of a telegraph pole and, you know, routes phone calls between different handsets and stuff. And there's only one box, only on top of one telegraph pole with all those wires going into it. So if it goes down, you've got a huge problem. You really need to make sure this thing never dies. And so they've designed systems um, not so that um, errors can't happen in the same way we see in, in like Rust or Haskell or, or you know, uh, languages that lean into static verification. Um, but instead, the other way, they said, no matter what happens, you're going to have some errors you know, there there could be a bug in the compiler. So even if the even if the compiler says everything's perfect, there could still be a bug there and something is wrong. Or what if your computer gets struck by a bolt of lightning, you know, and suddenly a bunch of ones become zeros and zeros becomes one in the memory or the hard drive or something. Something could go catastrophically wrong. How do you how do you deal with that through static analysis? Well you can't really. So we need to have a different system. So the idea is how can we embrace the fact that things are gonna go wrong because the universe is against us? And deal with that, and they've kind of they've kind of got a they've got a, they've got a numerous um, they've got a numerous set of techniques, but the the core idea I think is the idea of, of um, error isolation, um, process isolation, and it's kind of like a cruise ship really. So if you think about a modern cruise ship is divided into sections, and if um, you know they strike a rock or an iceberg or something, and it punctures the side of the ship. Water rushes through the hole and it floods a single compartment. But because they have this isolation between the different parts of the ship, the, sh the ship stays afloat. And rather than having to do something right now to stop the ship from sinking, they can sail to the harbour or the, the dock or wherever it is the, sh the ship goes, I don't know. Um, and then they can repair it in a way that it is, is, you know, obviously still challenging and it's obviously still a big problem. But it's much easier than doing it in, we've got 45 minutes before the, the world has ended, you know. So that's the idea, you know, building systems so that things can go wrong and that's OK. And they've achieved some really amazing things like you. There's, um, you know, you hear you hear rumors of, of um, Ericsson systems that have like nine nines of uptime. Is that true? Who knows? That's that's like that's like a couple seconds a year. Do they achieve that? I don't know. But it's quite it's quite bold that they can claim it. And we and we don't go. Obviously, they don't. Like the fact that we go, oh, maybe they have. Like that says a lot about the system. And there's, um, I've spoken to Erlang friends who, um, for example, there was a, a video streaming service and they had a bug in which they would crash every, I think, 30 frames. So like once, once a second they would crash and they didn't notice for six months because their system was so good at healing from errors that it just dropped a frame. It, it went, oh, something's gone wrong, rebuilt the state and tried again and it succeeded. That's really impressive. Now, I would say that they probably should have better monitoring if they were crashing once a second, didn't notice for six months. But the fact they could do that says a lot. And they had a much better time than, um, well, if the system went down like a more naively written thing would do. So that's really cool. It's it's a, uh, you know, and, and Gleam tries to unify that with the sort of Haskell, you know, the more the more common way of thinking about errors. So we want to try and eradicate as much as possible as we can when you're writing them. But we still want to have this thing at runtime where we say um, we can survive problems. And then you can dial in the, the, the amount of each one of those two philosophies, depending on your business needs. Because you might want to write, you know, if, you, if you're making a prototype, you might want to write like, you know, kind of hacky, fast and loose code where you don't check the error cases. 
and then you rely on the Erlang fault tolerance, like that's a really good use case. Or you might want to spend more time on the on the static analysis. But the important thing is that it's a really clear and explicit line about, you know, is this error intentional or is it accidental? If it's accidental, cool, we're going to fix it. If it's intentional, excellent. Then we use um, Erlang's fault tolerance for that. Right. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's that's a good good explanation about uh, uh, why why you picked Erlang uh, as as the as the backend. And uh, when you're talking about like this uh, moving this line right between um, uh, between intentional and unintentional errors, right? You, um, you you have some 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 other kind of similar lines in the language design itself, right? And uh, for example. Um, you know the, uh, the the named process uh, thing uh, in Gleam, um, and um, like distributed Erlang in Gleam, etc. So, so can you can you tell tell us a little bit about like what which bottles you pick and which bottles you save for later? Yeah. So I I think. Um... People have said for a long time that, you know, Erlang isn't typable because of X, Y, and Z. And I, for a long time, I sort of went, oh, yeah, well, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I believe them. And the more I thought about it, the more I don't agree. You can, solve, you can actually tackle all these problems with types, and that's really exciting. <clears throat> but in Gleam, we haven't. You know, we've chosen a subset of those problems to tackle. Um, and the reason for that is that I really want there to be, a, you know, a, 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 an Erlang-based language with a type system that is the kind I want to use. And there's been lots of other attempts to, to make, um, you know, statically typed Erlang languages. And it's very common for them to, you know, get a bit of momentum, get a bit of excitement. And they, they, they encounter some actually really difficult problem about applying types to, um, you know, OTP, the active framework, or, um, you know, um, distributed computing or something like that. And they sort of go, oh, Oh, what are we going to do here? And then they retreat to the library to do research, and then they never come back. <laughs> and they probably learnt loads of amazing things, but from the point of view of me, someone who wants to write probably quite boring programs in this language, I'm very frustrated because I'm I don't care that much about distributed computing. Not now, maybe not now at least, but you know, I would like to start getting start writing, um, you know, more mundane programs with this language. And so in Gleam, we've we've sort of taken some of the really difficult ones, for example, um, um, upgrading the code inside an already running system. This is something you can do inside Erlang, which is a really powerful tool, but most businesses don't need it. Most businesses can just use like a load balancer to swap out some new versions of their application, or they can have some downtime, or they've got some other way of, of rolling out new versions, because it's quite rare that a language can, you know, do hot upgrades. So we can just use the tools that everyone else uses. Fantastic. So we won't deal with, with hot upgrades. We won't deal with um, distributed computing uh, in a typed way because that's a really you know, complicated active area of research. Um, we don't want to tackle that right now. And you can just use the existing untyped Erlang mechanisms and those will work just fine in Gleam. You won't get any extra help, but that's okay. But we have for, you know, 30, 40 years being able to write really good programs that are, you know, all running, all run inside the single operating system process and can be, you know, single threaded or multi threaded, or concurrent or sequential and do loads of, of um, you know, wonderful, powerful things that covers, you know, 98% of programs in a, in a really practical timed fashion. So let's, let's take all that, all those um, known wins and apply them to the early ecosystem. So that's the goal with, with Gleam. And that's great because I think, I think maybe there's maybe there's others I, I'm not aware of, but I think that Gleam is now the most mature um, statically typed language on the on the Erlang VM. And because we've taken this approach to to focus on on what I see as the kind of pragmatic practical stuff, you know, we're in a place where um, you know all the stuff that I write for for my projects I'm writing in Gleam. That's really cool. There's there's lots of people writing little bits and bobs in Gleam. There's even been there's even been a few companies put Gleam into production and one one startup that um you know used Gleam as their main language. Like that's really exciting and I and we haven't seen that in, in some of the other um languages. Um 
before then. I think I think there are since some others have as well. But um, yeah, it's really exciting that we've we've managed to get a lot further. And then in future, once we've got all of the the common niceties, maybe then we can you know fight the dragon. Maybe then we can move on to distributed computing. But let's get all the the you know the the ninety the ninety five percent down first, and then we can move on to the rest later. Right. Uh, yeah, that's that's very cool and uh, an approach that is very in line, I think, with with the philosophy of of Erlang and uh, uh, Erlang forefathers. Right. Be be pr pragmatic first, and uh, and then figure out the the complications shall they arise. Um, so okay. Well, you said you said about bits and bobs um, written in Gleam. Um, the I remember being one of early adopters of Elixir. One of the questions was, okay, if I don't, if I just want to use your amazing like hash map module, right? Can I do it for, from Erlang? So kind of now, now we uh, we are living in a little bit of a different world, right? Like now, now it's the question, okay, I want to use your uh, Erlang library. Can I use it from Elixir, right? But okay. Um, but I, I think that with Gleam for the time being, it's it's the same question, right? So, so how would I go about building building up my uh, system in let's say Elixir or Erlang, and then for kind of mission critical stuff, how do I just just implement business logic integrated into the OTP uh, with supervision tree, yeah, uh, uh, of totally. another language? Yeah, I, I think I think this is really important, and I think this is one of the things. So, so there are other um, <clears throat> there are other statically typed languages on the Erlang VM. Um, two two of the two of the ones that are the most mature are um, Hamler and Purell. Both of them are based off the PureScript language, which is an amazing language. Like it's really 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 cool. So it's really really clever of them to use that existing language with its really well written compiler. As the basis of of their um, you know their new Erlang system, so that's really good. But uh, and and it's really and it's really easy for them to you know make use of Erlang libraries inside their um, inside their programs that are written in PureScript or Hamler. But it's a lot more challenging to um, call Purell code or to call Hamler code from Erlang, and um, that didn't that doesn't sit quite so well with me i i really want um gleam to be um you know a value add not just to the users of gleam but to all of the beam users put together and this this is sort of one of my my very mild criticisms of elixir as well because i i really love elixir but if you try and use an elixir program from erlang it's a little bit challenging because there's a few there's a few um you know like the, the standard library and a lot of, and a lot of the modules that are part of elixir have to sort of be distributed sort of implicitly like they don't come with they don't come via the package manager so you've got to have some special tooling to work with them um there's some additional steps in building an elixir project you need to compile all your code and then once you finish you can you consolidate the protocols well what that matters what that means it doesn't really matter but the point is there's an there's an additional compilation step which there isn't really a super easy way to do these things from other languages which which is kind of, which is awkward it's a bit of a shame and so when I was writing, when I was designing Gleam, one of the most important constraints was that I want it to be so easy to use um, a Gleam module or library or program or whatever from Erlang or from Elixir or from Hamler or from Purell um, that you didn't even know it was written in Gleam. I want you to be able to add the package to your dependencies and then just start calling functions. So it has to look perfectly like a normal um, Erlang library. Um, so like the same calling conventions, the same naming conventions, you know, the same data structures, it all has to work the same way. And I think that's worked really well. So um, we, we don't have quite the level of tooling that I want yet. I want it to be so that you don't even have to install the, the compiler, but we're well on the way to, to doing that. Um, we've done a lot of work on that in the latest release and we, I think we're getting pretty close. And so once we've done that, there's, um, you know, you could write your you could uh, write a library and then import it into a project and it just works. Or you could, um, you know, have an existing Erlang project and you just start writing some Gleam modules and your and your, your build tool will be able to, um, you know, compile it all and knit it all together. So that that's the goal. We really want it to work in both directions. We win because we gain from the Erlang people and the, all the great code they've written. And hopefully in future, they'll say, oh, I really want to use that new Gleam 
uh, I don't know, database client or web server or something like that, and they just import it and off they go. Like, and together we will be much stronger. Right, that, 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 that's very, very cool and uh, very synergistic. Um, and maybe that's a, that is a way to uh, to have a very powerful uh, meta programming in Gleam. Yeah, you can include it into uh, Elixir at compilation step and then have <laughs> some for loop that just calls a Gleam function and here you go. Um, okay, um, yeah, um, so well, we're, we're kind of like circling around uh, like lions around the, the, the Gleam compiler. So perhaps um, given the given the fact that normally uh, our audience is uh, interested in, in compilers themselves, so perhaps uh, we should um, take like a very brief small tour into the Gleam compiler starting with its uh, pipeline. So like uh, I, I know I'm putting you on the spot here and you don't have any like visual aid or slides to refer to. So like without visual aid, how would you go about um, explaining Gleam compiler's pipeline and like what would you emphasize? What are the special bits? Okay, um, I'll, I'll give it a go. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see how well this works. Um, so the Gleam, this is, this is the second Gleam compiler or maybe the third. Um, and it's written in Rust. The first version was written in Erlang, um, but it got too difficult, so I, I ended up switching to Rust. Um, and the, one of the, the deliberate things about Gleam is that um, <clears throat> from a sort of implementation and design point of view, none of the bits of technology used are particularly state-of-the-art or revolutionary. It's all about picking things that are tried and tested and you know have been established as being good ways of doing things for a long time so um we've got a we've got a fairly um the, I'll, t I'll talk about just the very the very heart of the compiler that processes a single module because there's lots of other you know build tools and rigmarole around that but you know we're interested in you know the bit that the bit that works on the code so it starts with a with a, um, a fairly old-fashioned handwritten um lexer and parser that takes your syntax takes your um source code file and turns it into a syntax tree Nothing particularly exciting going on there. We used to use a parser generator, but we found moving to a hand-rolled one um, resulted in like a three times speed increase and dramatically better error messages. So I'm I'm all about the handwritten ones these days. Um, and then after that, we move into um, static analysis. So we have this untyped syntax tree, and then we um, perform um, type inference on it. So Gleam, while completely type checked, it doesn't actually require any type annotations. The whole thing can be done through inference, much in the same way as um, OCaml or or um, Elm. Uh, and we use uh, a Hindley Miller type system, uh, uh, specifically uh, we use Algorithm W, which is you know a fairly old fashioned but actually really good um, type inference algorithm. So we use that to um, infer the types of of every single node in our syntax tree, and then we transform the syntax tree into a, a typed representation, which is annotated with loads of um, information like what are the types of um, you know each node. Um, any constructors, where do they get imported from? Which of the multiple different Erlang scopes do the different things live in? Because you need to know whether it's module scope or local scope, because Gleam only has one scope, so we need to map our scope onto multiple different ones. And and um, in future, it also contain like exhaustive, exhaustiveness checking information, but we, we sadly lack that at the moment. So once we've got this like very rich typed syntax tree, we can then move on to um, code generation at this point, you can go one of two ways. You can go to the, the JavaScript route, or you can go into the Erlang route, depending on which, which target you are trying to um, you know, compile to. But in both cases, we, we output um, source code. The first versions of the, the Gleam compiler outputted um, like an intermediate representation that was that's used by the Erlang compiler. But now we just use um, Erlang source code, um, which is actually really nice because it's a really stable API. It's really portable. It works absolutely everywhere. It doesn't matter if you change the version of the Erlang compiler, it still works. And it's really easy to test. You know, we can now say, hey, look, this Gleam code should result in this Erlang code. You know, you're just looking at a string input and a string output. That's really easy to work with. Um, it's mildly more complicated because we pretty print the code. We, 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 one of the things we try to do um, in Gleam 
possibly in part um, linking into the we want to play as nicely with Erlang people as possible. So we want them to be able to understand the actual code. We want the output to look like it was written by a human. And so we have quite an intelligent, pretty printer that works similar to... Um, oh, the Elixir, the Elixir formatter works in exactly the same way. It uses the same algorithm. So we output... Um, instead of outputting a Erlang source file directly, we we output a sort of intelligent um, printing algebra that will say... that has all the information of that code, but also says, um, if this is getting to a line, you could indent here, you could wrap here, that sort of thing. And then we just throw it through the pretty printer and it will output a, a string, which we then feed into the Erlang compiler or the, 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 the JavaScript runtime that you, you're having to be using. So that sort of thing. And there's a few points there at which we would also, um, you know, serialize metadata. You know, we take all the type information from the tree and write it to a file. And then next time we don't have to recompile all the modules. If they've changed, we can just read that again, that sort of thing. Um, and lastly, there's a, there's a third secret um, backend for the Gleam compiler. So there's there's Erlang and there's JavaScript. There's also Gleam. We also have a Gleam to Gleam compiler, and that's for the formatter. In that case, we do no type checking. We just read in the source file, and then we print it again. And because we use a pretty printer, you've got a formatted Gleam file, so we can use that in, in your editor and stuff to make sure everything looks nice. Yeah, that's uh, the, the third one is also very important, yeah, because... Uh... Practice shows that that uh, integrating just just integrating a formatter in your uh, pipeline just alleviates so much stress and so much noise from from Git history, etc. Uh, so yeah, a great call there. Um, in general, when I tried Gleam, um, you say that how you're missing this tool and that tool, but for me the the onboarding experience was very nice and smooth, and I felt like uh, perhaps. I'm a little biased because um, I was comfortable with re rebar already, but uh, for me that felt very smooth and nice. But I heard, uh, and sorry, we'll circle back to the compiler again. But I heard you 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 have uh, recently made um, a, something like a package manager, right? For mm. or or yeah. or some sort of dependency manager. Yeah, can you say a couple of words of, about that? Sure. Um, I'm I'm I'm, re I'm very glad you've said that you found the onboarding experience um, good because you know that's that's again trying to be pragmatic that's really important first impressions are, are super important it doesn't matter if you've got a really lovely language if everyone tries it and goes oh I couldn't work out how to run the program or like oh how do I install deps oh I added my dep but then it didn't work I'm like what's going on and th these things keep cropping up a lot because you know the, the Erlang build tool rebar is actually very good but it's kind of an unusual um, user experience. And if you're not used to some of the Erlang ways of thinking, some of the Erlang ways of structuring a program, it can be quite alien. And that's put that's put a lot of people off, particularly people who are from non beam ecosystems, like people from from JavaScript or, or, or you know other languages. And that's a shame because I, you know, I I want one of the goals of Gleam is to attract more people to the beam. If I'm just if I'm sucking up all of the Erlang programmers and Alexa programmers, it's just the same collection of people in the same room just like writing a different syntax. We've not grown anywhere. I really want to bring more people to this virtual machine because it's, you know, it's wonderful. So people who said, well, I really, I was interested in Erlang, but there was no, you know, there's no type checker or, or I didn't like the syntax or these sort of things. Maybe they want to come to Gleam. So that's the hope. And so to that, we need to have a, a better onboarding experience. And that's been the motivation to, to make the new build tool, which I'm hoping I'm going to release soon. I've got one, I've got one open issue left. So as soon as I can get that closed, I'm going to, release of um, the first version of it. Um, but yeah, it's, the idea is to have a, a really unified experience. So the only thing you need to install is Gleam and then you go and run like Gleam New and Gleam Test and Gleam Run and it will just do everything rather than, oh, I made a project with Gleam New but now I need to use Rebar and how do I add depths and it all been a bit disjointed. Um, but it's it's quite a challenge building a build tool. It's been it's taken an, a long time, and and it's got to include things as you said. It's got to have a dependency manager. It's got to have a package management system. That's really challenging. Um, but fortunately, we can you know stand on stand on the shoulders of giants, as it were, and we can and you know this knits into the goal of being a good a good player in you know the Erlang world. We can use the the Erlang and Elixir package manager hex. And so rather than building, you know, all the backend infrastructure and work out how it's going to be distributed and, and how this information is to be surfaced and provide APIs and running and all the stuff, we can just um, use their 
use their existing package match system. And then we the only things we've got to build are, um, you know, the sort of nitty gritty plumbing of how do you um, how do you pull down depths? How do you push up depths? You know, just building building tarballs and checking checksums and, and, you know, checking checking things have been signed correctly and, and all that sort of stuff. And um, one actually really quite hairy bit of complicated computer science of resolving versions. So if you depend upon package A and it depends upon package B and it depends upon package C, like how do you traverse this tree in a way where it gives you versions that meet all of those constraints? Um, which, which was very hard. And this is another area in which um, Rust saved us to some degree. So there's a really lovely algorithm called PubGrub for this, which I think is supposed to be the, the state of the art. At least it's the, the one I could find that everyone was raving about the most, um, which was invented by the, the, the package management team um, over for, for the Dart language. It, it's very impressive. I won't, I won't try and explain why it's impressive because it's, it's very complicated, but it's fast and it's reliable and it's easy to understand as a user, not as an implementer, it's very hard. Um, and and I, I sat down with the paper and I tried to understand it and I really struggled for a long time. And then I discovered that if you look on the package manager for Rust, someone's just put an implementation on there. <laughs> the, team that, the team that maintains the Rust build tool implemented this. Um, I'm not sure if it is to use in Rust, but they implemented it for something. And then they just put it, popped up as a library. So I was able to, to pull that down um, you know, use the API they provided. And between that and all the work that the Hex team has done, we've got a work it, working package management system. So that was, that was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm super happy with, with how it's gone. And I'm super thankful for all these people for making these excellent tools that we can use. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that, that's a great story and also a very lucky timing, I think. Um, for, yeah, for Purell that, that you have mentioned, uh, they're using a combination of Spago and DAL language. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, I'm, 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 perhaps I'm like super biased, but I found this experience, well, for the first like 15 minutes scary, because that's a lot to, to like yeah. uh, take. But as a Nix user, I've, I felt very comfortable then creating my own package set and so, so this is obviously kind of a different mindset here. Here they say, they ask developer to understand kind of what is the, the set of the software that the developer knows will work with their system yeah. um, and, and provide very nice ways to, to, to communicate that to, to the build tool. And yeah. then, yeah, and then it just works kind of, and then it's nice and uh, very extend like you can extend it and uh, etc but of course it's completely different experience than just throwing some uh, some sometimes even kind of arbitrary constraints uh, to to your uh, dependency list and then it somehow magically working yeah uh, it, so. it's kind of brilliant the whole the whole the whole package set system is it's so clever um, rather than like you've got here's a really complicated set of constraints do some very sophisticated computer science in order to well maths in, in order to try and figure it out they go no we won't do that there's only one version of each package you go oh <laughs> wow that's really easy that's really good that's so clever they've sidestepped the entire problem um, as with many things in Gleam if Gleam existed in a bubble like there was no Erlang there was no Elixir there was just the beam this runtime I don't know why it would exist because there's no languages for it. And then I came along and wrote a language that ran on top of it. Gleam, I think, could, could very well use um, package sets. It, it would do a lot of things quite differently. But because the whole Erlang and Elixir system works around, you know, specifying constraints and resolving that, we've got to play ball with that. I can't, I can't, I can't. How am I going to integrate into an existing Erlang app if I say, and if you want to use Gleam, please move your package management over to use to you know, using package sets, and then add all your Erlang things to this package system that doesn't have them in. It's like, how's that going to work? It just isn't yeah. going to work. So, um, yeah, we couldn't do that. We had to do the hard computer science. <laughs> it's a no, shame. I mean, package but, sets but, are really beautiful. They are, they are, but but they still have the trade-off, right? Like you have to, if you if you need to, if some if everything works, then it works really well. But when something mm. doesn't work, you kind of have to sit down and think. Perhaps not for a long time, but it's still kind of more strain where, like for example, Elixir doesn't have it, right? Yeah, 
mean, there are also edge cases where, like, the elixir. This, this is one of the reasons why I put so much work into um, uh, researching, you know, systems for resolving these constraints because it it is not common, but it is possible to get the elixir version, um, you know, uh, version resolver system into a bit of a spin, and it can either spend a lot of time. Um, to resolve something that seems relatively simplistic or it can really struggle to find a solution and so i think they're also investigating moving over to to, to pub grab i'm not sure if that i'm not sure if they are or not but i heard rumors that was the case um you know so that, that it's like it's almost like there's no silver bullet like no matter which way you go there's a lot of there's a lot of difficulties and if damn you look at bad um, engineering <laughs> <laughs> damn maths causing problems again um but if, if you look at the so i think the biggest um package set based system is uh, the haskell one uh for for um, stack i think is it called stackage i can't remember and oh, they're yeah. kind of interesting because um they it's a it's a package set but in order to upgrade it because it's so large they then have a version solver in order to 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 work out what should be in the set so it seems like perhaps you'd also get some um you know some some limitations on scaling package sets that maybe you don't with um you know resolving it every time well, yeah, but I mean, another another approach is uh, to actually have a programming language for your packages, right? Like Nix is doing, and well, actually, like like uh, Pure is doing, and then you will have uh, basically kind of you will not depend on like you will in significantly increase the granularity of your pack of the atoms, so to speak, in your package set, and by this virtue, you will be able to have kind of more fluid uh, upgrades, right? And uh, you can have like two completely different pieces of software can be encoded with the same expression because the, like two, 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 two pieces of software with completely different feature sets, right? Can be encoded in, with the same expression and, and then like one system can depend on one kind of version and the other can be depending on the other and they can coexist in the same kind of package set, so to speak. So this is, uh, yeah, uh, I think a big uh, achievement of, of, of Nix. It's super impressive. And I was very interested in exploring both Nix and Dahl for, for um, like the Elixir build tool and system. Elixir, sorry, for the Gleam build tool and system. But, you know, the, the, at some point, one, one of the things that I think is very impactful, like perhaps counterintuitively for those of us who are in you know, strange niche functional programming circles where we like we like Nix and we like Erlang and we like all these weird weird things. You know, things looking familiar has a huge impact on whether people are likely to use them or not. You know, if if I say to you, "Hey, look, here's a JSON file or a TOML file or something," and you just write package name equals this, and then it works to some degree, you go, "Oh, cool, yeah, I'll do that." You know, most people are pretty happy with that. Well, if I say, oh, look, well, it's in a language called Nix and you've got to learn a little bit about it first and how it works. But then once you have, it's really good. Like just that that little barrier is, is, is such a turnoff for a lot of people. And, you know, you end, it ends up being a real trade-off. And uh, an, exa an example of this would be Gleam syntax. So if you look at the really beginning of Gleam, um, it had a syntax that looked quite a lot like Haskell. Like it had a more traditional ML style syntax with, you know, no, no parentheses and no curly brackets and none of this stuff. And at some point we switched over to, to the one we, we know today it looks a lot more like, you know, um, C or Scala or, or, or JavaScript or something like that. And even though I don't, I don't really care about syntax. So for me, it's like, this is kind of a non change. It doesn't matter. Like after a little bit you're used to it. People loved it. People absolutely loved this change and it made a huge impact on how many people were taking up the language. So familiarity is is super important. Yeah, yeah that's that's for sure. And I mean, even I myself admitted that uh, for the first like minutes of interacting with pure URL, um package sets, I, I was, since I have never seen Spago and Dal, it I was scared a little bit and it's... Uh, yeah, it's it's certainly certainly like kind of uh, smoother, more familiar experiences are are very important. Um, okay, let's uh, let's let's kind of uh, really quickly finish the uh, the, the compiler stuff uh, because um, well, as far as I imagine, writing a compiler of that size, uh, I would imagine that 
it for for it to perform somewhat reasonably, I would imagine that it would require uh, quite some, uh, well, maybe not quite some, but but a considerable amount of like uh, mutable state to actually be efficient with 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 what we're doing. Um, and in my experience, which is very limited to competitive programming, uh, Rust makes it a huge pain uh, to, to, at the same time, write like idiomatic code and write mutable data structures that are non-trivial, mm -hmm. right? For example, uh, I'll publicly admit that I don't know how to write uh, breadth first search in Rust uh, without copying the whole tree every mm -hmm. on every iteration. Um, so, what 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 was your experience with 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 doing that? Did you just kind of drop uh, the Id idiomatic constructs and like just wrote some like yeah? How 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 do you do that? I, I think I probably have a, a, an advantage in that I don't know what idiomatic Rust code is really. <laughs> um, when I so I I'd, always, I'd been um, a fan of Rust since a little bit before version one dropped, but in the way where I'd admire it from afar, and then I would every three, four, five, six months, I'd write a program in it and I go, this is really cool. And then I'd get stuck on something like, oh, never mind, I'll throw it away. I'll go back to writing Erlang or something like that or writing Haskell. Um, but always admired it. But and then a point came when I needed, I needed to, I felt like I needed to rewrite the uh, Glean compiler because um, I was writing in Erlang and I wasn't very happy with how that was going. Um, both because I, I thought like the tooling, the language wasn't super suited to writing a compiler. And also just because I'd accrued a lot of tech debt because this was like, you know, this is the first prototype of the compiler. So I need to start again. And it was an opportunity to reevaluate my tooling choices. And so that was when I really, you know, bought into Rust very hard. And um, the first version of it was I just copied almost line for line from Erlang into Rust. And I was like, and once I have that working, I can then refactor it until it is good Rust. Um, which is which it worked, but I'm not sure it was a good good approach to take, to be honest, because like it did lots of odd things. If you try and move everything to recursion in Rust, a language where you're not guaranteed tail call uh, optimization, y you just blow the stack all over the place, which caused me all sorts of issues. Um, but I I think it's a real it's a real shame. Rust is a wonderful language, but like there's a lot more um, there's a lot more upfront investment in order to becoming really productive in Rust. But I think once you're productive, you're very productive, but like you have to work a lot harder to get there. And I don't think this is because Rust has bad documentation or tutorials or any of these things. I actually think it's some of the best I've ever seen, possibly the best I've ever seen, but they're just teaching something that is 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 very complicated. Like if you are exposing how, if, if how the memory management works is part of your language, you have to deal with so many things inside the computer that you just didn't have to deal with in other languages. And that's a real, that's a real challenge. And I think, I think the solution to this is, um, um, as you're starting, don't try and do the good solution. Like as you said, you can't do a depth, you can't do um, a depth first traversal of a tree or breadth first traversal of a tree without cloning the entire tree in every iteration. Well, clone the tree in every iteration. Then, like if your program still works, that's okay. There's loads of things inside the Glim compiler where I'm definitely doing the the slow thing and I'm definitely cloning it. But even with my you know, not partic even my then not very good version of the Glim compiler, um, in which I cloned loads of things and I made loads of mistakes and it was written in really bad Rust. It was much faster than the Erlang version. And I'm a good Erlang programmer, or at least I think I am. Maybe I'm not because I, cause I, I was beaten by the rubbish Rust, but like it was still faster just because like it is that much more of an optimized language. And then since then, I've been able to, as I learn things, go, you know, I, I come to touch an area of the code base again and go, why was I doing that? Oh, I, I know how that should be done now. I'm going to fix it. And it gets faster. So there's there's been a few um, Gleam releases in which I've, I've also published some benchmarks. And it's been really nice to see like, oh, wow, it's taking, um, you know, half the time to type check a module as it used to. And things just keep getting better. And I'm sure there's loads of loads and loads and loads of problems in it still. But it's, it's much faster than it was before. So a, a program that works... Um, inefficiently is still better than one that doesn't work at all. And if you are cloning a lot, there's a few um, kind of rubbish, well, rubbish. There's kind, of, there's kind of a few things that feel bad in Rust that you can do, like swap to a um, a reference counted pointer or a, uh, or a garbage collected pointer instead of the normal ones, 
which when you do that in Rust, you feel like you've lost. Like you're like, oh man, I've, I haven't done this the proper way. But then if you think for a moment about what your uh, Erlang or, or Haskell or whatever program is, every single pointer is a garbage collected or reference counted pointer. So you're already doing far better. Well, maybe not. Depends depends exactly what it compares to, but like you're already doing pretty good. It's okay to just like slap in some of these, uh, you know, these little easy mode buttons. So just, just, just go wild. And in future, you may remove them or you may discover that doesn't actually make any difference that reference counting like it's almost exactly the same performance you're not you're not writing gosh i don't know you're not writing something where performance matters that much um so yeah go for it in general like algorithms and and data structures are kind of some of them are pretty difficult uh as, as many of us know. Uh, so how, so, and as far as I, I remember, as far as I understand, uh, right now it's a dialogue between two dropouts. So uh, <laughs> did, did, did they manage to, to teach you uh, those in uni before you dropped out or, uh, or, 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 so how do you learn all this kind of pretty impressive amount of, of, of uh, skills to, to be able to implement this sort of stuff? Well, I, I, they didn't teach me any any useful algorithms in my biology degree, which is probably part of why I why I dropped out. Really, um, yeah, I I, I I I at some point made a mistake and I thought I was going to study microbes or something, um, but uh, it turned, I got I got to undergrad level and I realised that wasn't for me. It took me two years to realise it wasn't for me, so that was possibly a mistake. But I I, I did eventually leave, and I was very fortunate. And then I. Um, I realized that thing that I like, computers, oh yeah, you can actually work with computers. So I ended up, and I very fortunately ended up doing that instead. Otherwise, I guess Gleam would have been like a, a vaccine or something, who knows. Um, but so for me, um, I'm very much driven by, and I, you know, I'm sure other people have different ways of learning, but I find a way that um, works tremendously well, um, which people don't seem to talk about enough, is having learning driven by projects. So I didn't sit down, well, I have sat down with books of like typing algorithms and read them, but that's not because I wanted to learn it in, in, in isolation. It's because I was writing a compiler and I was trying to write a type system. Like if you actually have a need for this algorithm, you can start, you can actually start to learn it. And I, I think there's a real difference between learning things in, in, you know, a book or a video or whatever medium you like. You can you can learn a a particular kind of familiarity with these algorithms, but you can't really learn so much about um, you can't learn some of these more intuitive things that you learn from actually engineering these things on a daily basis. Like how do I debug this? Or when something strange happens, you look at it and go, that feels to me like something in that area of the code. You know, learning how to how to look at the performance of it and and and, and all these other things that actually on a day to day basis are really practical. And if you're just learning it from a book. You don't get the same exhilaration as you know. If you re you read the 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 the, um, the chapter on type systems a few times and you go, yeah, I understand this. That feels good. But if you've written a compiler and you 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 write your program and then you run the compiler on it and it says, well, this returns an int, you go, oh, I'm a god. <laughs> it works. That feels so good. And that rush is so much more of a of a motivator than anything else. And you go, well, I've got a basic type checker. I really would love to have generics because then I could write this program. And that's a that's a really great motivator to keep you working as opposed to just like, well, now I'll read the chapter on generics. It's a bit dry, but like that's the next thing. Right. So like build things, you know, um, you know, the whole, the whole Gleam project started as a, as a learning experience that just sort of became accidentally useful. And now the motivation is, is it being useful, but um, it's still very much, um, you know, the learning around Gleam is motivated by wanting to build the thing. I wanted to build a compiler so I learned how compilers work. And now I want Gleam to have this thing because it would help people. So I will learn how to add, I will learn how to do uh, version resolution for, for, you know, package trees, you know, that sort of thing. So have a goal and then learn around the goal. Um, yeah. All right. Well, uh, we should, start going into q a so i'll ask the the final question um which is the same question really i ask uh, many other uh people who are developing programming languages in interviews like this um 
but phrased a little bit differently. So it's about the future of Gleam, yeah. And, and my question mm-hmm. would be the following. If a reasonably ethical company uh, would donate 640,000 pounds to you uh, to budget Gleam development over two years, uh, what sort of team would you build and uh, what would you then try to do with this team? Ooh, what, a, what, an, what an interesting, exciting question, because there, there's so many different things you can do. And the, the two years bit's kind of interesting, because it's like, well, you could just have one person and they could work for 10 years and not much money, or you could try and blow it out really quickly. You know, it's, it's, re- it's really difficult to understand like what the, you know, the, what the right thing to do is. So go, going back to the, you know, the, we, we want something that I'm trying to make the language that I want to use you know, for boring things forever, you know, I want this to be practical and pragmatic and sustainable. And so, you know, I don't think, I don't think the, the you know, trying to, I don't think the way to do this would be to try and go, well, I want to have, um, you know, IDE support and I want to have this thing. So I should find an IDE person. I should find a type person. I think the real question here is how could we use this money to make Gleam um, sustainable by itself, you know, because Gleam, Gleam gets, um, sponsorship from, from people that decide they want to sponsor the project. And so they donate, you know, $5 a month or something. And that's awesome. That's really great. And then I've invested a lot of my own time and money into making it work just cause you know, that's what I want to do. And, and between those two things we've been, and you know, people volunteer, you know, patches in their time and they write programs, you know, in the open source way. And all that together, that's enough to, to get us where we are. But, you know, really we want it to be a vehicle that's capable of, of um, you know, sustaining the livelihoods of a team of people who would keep it alive for other businesses to use, you know, make it a sustainable enterprise in much in the same way that, um, you know, Elixir has managed, even though they don't have like an Ericsson or a Facebook or someone else payrolling them. So I think the thing to do would be to get as many of, of the, the people who have been in similar situations like Jose Valim, or, or um, um, you know, Evan who created Elm or, you know, some of these other people and ask them, you know, how, how did you get to where you are? You know, what, what did you need to do? Did you, do you, are there things that um, Gleam can learn from you and just have a real, you know, honest to frank conversations about, um, you know, how to get somewhere sustainable. And they're all lovely people, they're all super lovely people. So I'm sure they'd be very happy to help. And then once we've done that research, which I imagine will take quite some time, we can start then actually using the money to to move in that direction wherever it may be so, uh, speculating i think continuing to improve the sort of onboarding and developer experience is going to be um really important particularly um you know as i touched on ide support you know so implementing language server protocol i think be really impactful because um no matter what way we try to finance the the language and the ecosystem um we're always going to need, you know, you, it, you're going to need to have a way to attract people to, to the language. So people have to be walking around saying, God, I love Gleam. It feels really good. And at the moment, people are saying, Gleam's really cool. I really like it. I wish it had, you know, in editor stuff, you know, that's, that's a really common thing. So we're definitely going to need to have some basics of that. I think that's, that's going to be a no brainer. But after that, oh, I don't know. Who knows? Very exciting though. Do you happen to know a, a reasonably ethical company with six hundred and forty thousand dollars or pounds, or whatever it was? Uh, well, I mean, <laughs> we can talk well, after this. It's okay. You don't, yeah, have, yeah, to, yeah. You don't have to tell anyone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we our our money is uh, is currently tied out uh, tied in uh, developing a Glasgow Haskell compiler, but uh, maybe oh. after we after we get <laughs> dependent types uh, shipped in Haskell. We can we can see other uh, options for other compilers to contribute them. Awesome. All right. So so before we go into Q and A, I would like to remind the viewers that uh, we're inviting people for you. So if you have any feedback or questions that you want to ask, um, and you didn't catch the recording live, you, please feel free to uh, ask them in comments, for example. And um, if you want to manage to get to see the live sessions, uh, subscribe to the channel. And uh, yes, uh, maybe even subscribe to notifications. I, for example, am uh, very selective with the channels I subscribe to, but I tend to enable notifications uh, for for the channels I'm truly interested in. Um, and 
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to hang around the, in the comments as well. So if you ask a question in the comments, I'll, I'll, I'll be sure to be able to answer it. So, you know, oh, that's, that's very away. nice. Thank you. And uh, Louis, if you want to plug something, uh, no elixir pun intended, uh, please go ahead <laughs> before we go to questions. Well, I, as you can as you can probably guess, I, I'm, you know, come get involved in Gleam if you think any of this sounds, um, you know, interesting or, or fun or exciting. You know, join join our Discord. There's a lovely little community. We've we've passed more than 500 members now, which blows my mind. It's really exciting. There's there's a lot of nice people there um, talking about all sorts of nonsense. Most of it related to Gleam, but not exclusively. And if uh, if you want to hack on on libraries or compilers or any of these things, there's loads of things, uh, loads of issues on GitHub that you can get involved in. Um, what they're tagged with ones we think they'd be good for beginners or newcomers or um, you know ones where we could do with some help. Um, and if you want to talk about any of, the, any of those things, again, catch me on, on Discord and I'm super happy to help anyone get started or, or give feedback. And lastly, if you really, really um, like Lean, uh, consider sponsoring us on, on, on GitHub and um, yeah, get us get us that little bit closer to being um, completely sustainable. All right. Uh, yeah. So let's ask some questions. Uh, so we have three questions right now. Uh, first, uh, I'll ask the the one about uh, foreign function interfaces so the question goes is it possible to ffi an import okay oh so it's like kind of about second second order ffis okay so the question is is it possible to ffi an import of an ffi in both directions so as far as i understand they ask like if you ffi something into elixir let's say I don't I don't quite understand the question but <laughs> yeah anyway can you can you tell t tell us about how far can you push foreign function interfaces between let's say gleam <clears throat> and erlang for example so I don't know if this answers the question but a the foreign function interface is um effectively just a call to any you know uh, beam function so if it is a callable function you can use it via the ffi and it doesn't matter what the origin is, and we also don't we also don't know if the types you've given it are correct or not. So, FFI is two things. First, it is it's letting the 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 language know that a function exists with this name, and so we would we would call it as a normal Erlang function. And it could be Elixir, it could be LFE, it could be Pure Erl, it could be you know it could be anything. Could could be another. You could even import a Gleam function that was defined in the same module as an external function it doesn't matter so long as it's a public function you can you can import it the other thing that happens at that point is effectively a typecast so if you say this is a function called reverse and it takes a list and it returns a list we will just believe you um there's no way for us to type check arbitrary beam functions so every every um call of the foreign function interface is effectively a typecast which is unsafe but that's okay because like you've you, you know the rest of your program is checked and then if there's a problem you can identify it. it's got to be at this boundary here um, and there's techniques you can do to, to make it safer with runtime checks but you know th those are the two core things that it is yeah and the other way around i assume that there is just no foreign function interface right you just call gleam stuff from erlang yeah yeah so once gleam's compiled it's just an, it just it is an Erlang module, so if your language just calls Erlang functions, it, you can just call the functions. If you're writing Purel or, or um, Hamler or anything where you do need to actually import it in some fashion, then you just import it like normal. There's, there's, it, it, it's designed to be exactly the same as um, Erlang. And for Gleam data structures, we also output um, Erlang record definitions in header files. So you can then import the records into Erlang or Elixir or whatever it is, and you can use those the same ways you would in, in the language. So it, it should feel pretty much exactly the same as normal Erlang code. And how would you go about calling Gleam from JavaScript? Um, same thing. We, we output pretty standard looking JavaScript. It's very slightly more unusual code in JavaScript than Erlang. Um, because we used classes for the data types and classes are like slightly less common than than planar objects um it it's mostly just so that we can there's a few things that javascript doesn't have 
um, like for example, just structural equality. We needed some way to hook into that. In order to do that, we need to be able to identify the difference between a um, you know a, a typical mutable JavaScript object and something that's a you know an immutable Gleam object. So we needed some way of injecting in um, you know a tiny bit of extra functionality. So um, you know records in in Gleam are classes rather than being um, what would what would an Erlang tuple be in JavaScript? I guess an array, but actually it kind of makes it easier to work with because when you print it, it actually looks like a Gleam data structure rather than it being, oh, it's an array of four elements and the third one is a string and the second one is an int. Like, what is that? You know, that can actually yeah. be really confusing at runtime. All right. Uh, so the next, I, I really hope that we answered your question. If, if you have a uh, follow-up, please ask. So uh, another question is, uh, does Gleam's static type so do Gleam's static types facilitate any optimizations that aren't feasible in Erlang or Elixir? Um, yes, yes, uh, it, 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 <clears throat> it does some today and it can also do, do some additional things in future. Um, a really, really simple um, example, um, but one that m makes my day better every time um, it's used is um, calling anonymous functions in Gleam. You just, you just, it doesn't matter if, it, if it's a function that's defined in the module or if it's a function that you've assigned to a variable, you just say function name brackets, that's all you do. While in in, um, uh, in Elixir, there's a different syntax. If it's a module function, it's function name brackets. If it's anonymous function, it's function name dot brackets. Um, that's because Elixir doesn't know enough about the program in order to be able to tell you where the function is defined. So it would just say, you tell me which which scope it's in. And if it's not in that scope, I will crash. Well, Gleam, when you call it, it says, okay, and now I, with all this information I've got, I can look and work out which scope it's gonna be in. So it ends up being a lot less verbose. This also extends up to like the, the pipe operator, the pipe operator, the pipe operator in Elixir always puts the argument in the first position. Um, so, you know, main, uh, so A piped into main BC becomes main ABC. In Gleam, we look to see if it would work in the first position. If it does, it goes there. Or we look to see if calling that um, expression would return a function that takes one argument. And if so, then we put it in, in that one. So we can like intelligently work out where it's meant to fit in. And there's other things too, like um, we have uh, labeled arguments, like keyword arguments. Um, that would be given as a map or a list in Elixir. Um, we can just resolve them statically. So there's like zero overhead in giving um, names to arguments, which you can't do in Elixir. There's always going to be some um, some runtime overhead there. That's really cool. Yeah, uh, whichever whichever tweaks to to pipe operator uh, people come up with, I'm always on board. When Joe was suggesting to have pipe one, pipe two, pipe three, et cetera, I was like, yeah, that's so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, because it's basically kind of as close to kind of weird currying as you can get, I guess. Um, all right. Um, another one is, uh, can you pull in a Gleam thingy, I assume a module or a library, or a library via a mixed dependency? Yep, that works today. You can totally do that. People already do. Um, it, it just so so. If you are going to do it today, you will need to have the Gleam compiler installed. So um, probably is that true? I think that probably be true. But in a in a in a it depends how you've built the package. But yes, generally that is true. In future versions, um, we will ship not only the uh, original Gleam files that. Gleam um, projects will then use, but we'll also ship the generated Erlang code. So you could import it into your mix project or your rebar project, your Erlang make project, and then run compile. And it will pick up the already generated Erlang, which is compatible across all OTB versions that are currently supported. Um, and the Gleam files are ignored and you can just use that um, as it is. So there'll be no additional um, tooling needed to, to, to use Gleam code. All right, um, let's just uh, wait for one more minute to see if there are any uh, other questions. And uh, yeah, in the meantime, I, I just remembered what I wanted to say uh, previously. Uh, and when you when we were talk was, when we started talking about like pulling mixed dependencies and stuff, I I remembered how um, one of the 
like game changers in my opinion is that um, in Gleam uh, organization everything has uh, GitHub workflows workflow files or mm. however they are called and uh, yeah for for me it was a very uh, another uh, another thing that 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 made it uh, so that I can for example uh, kind of contribute some minor changes and always be sure that uh, I'm not doing something stupid. And also I have learned uh, how to use GitHub workflows. Thanks to, <laughs> <laughs> thanks to Gleam uh, repositories. All right. I don't think we have any other questions. So uh, Louis, thank you very much for, uh, for sitting down uh, with us today. And uh, it was really nice. And yeah, if you want to, uh, show off some of your uh, new <laughs> stuff when you when you uh, improve Gleam further. Uh, do share, come again. Will do. Cool, yeah, thank, thank you for having me. It's been, uh, yeah, it's been it's been really fun and, and, and actually an honor to be invited. I, I watched the previous talks and I thought they were fantastic, really good and like such a cool collection of names. So uh, thank you very much for having me. Hopefully I can come again in, in the future where, where Gleam's even better. Thank you, thank you very much.